Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Amber Data Podcast. Uh, I am Director of Research Chris Martin, joining uh, you today with Theo. Theo comes from Merkel. Uh, Theo, I have so many questions on uh, everything you guys are doing at Merkel, as well as you getting your thoughts in general on what's going on right now. Uh, but let's start with uh, an introduction. Can you tell us about yourself? Give us a, a quick like history of. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, um, I'm the CEO at Merkel. Uh, we're basically an MEV company. Um, that's a little bit broad, but I'll go into some more details in a bit, obviously. Um, but basically, you know, our core product is like a private mempool that we sell to RPC providers, wallets uh, to like do some MEV protection extraction. Um, but we'll talk about that as well. And the reason I started this company is because um, I was a searcher for a bit before that. So I got like firsthand experience with MEV, um, you know, bad and good MEV. Uh, and also I worked at Coinbase for a little bit. Uh, and understood like NFTs and trading and just, you know, blockchain in general. So I've been hooked into blockchain for I think the better part of the last two years. Wow, that's awesome. How did you get started in crypto? Uh, it was, uh, I think it's like DeFi summer kind of got me interested in 2020. And, it can, and then, uh, well, actually, that's not really true. I started in 2017. And at the time, um, it was really hard to actually build smart contract. I think it was like hard hat was starting uh, and Truffle uh, and Ganache were around. Uh, and it was just not a good experience, to be honest. <laughs> so I kind of, and at the time I was working in in like Web2, really like old school, like Web2 company. So I was like, okay, I'll put this aside for a bit. Um, and then in 2020, I got more interested in because of DeFi summer that had just happened. So, uh, and then Polygon was just starting. So it was like the first time we had a really fast chain. Uh, and then I played around with a few things and it was the time where, you could see the difference in prices um, just on the swap UI. Like you could go to like Sushi Swap and they will have a price, and then you go to Uniswap and it have a different price. And I was like, you know, that like idea. Well, maybe I should just buy and sell them these two things. Um, and then I started like writing a JavaScript bot that would do it. And then I discovered like Flashbot and went down the rabbit hole. Um, but unfortunately, you know, my bot never really made any money or it was kind of like a fun thing. And I was building a startup, you know, in AI at the time, which is like not the best timing of looking back at it. Uh, and so that's kind of um, how I got into blockchain. And then I got much more serious uh, when I joined Coinbase, obviously, uh, last year. Um, but, you know, still kept an eye on blockchain this whole time. And, um, and you know, in the end, decided to start a company and doing MEV. So, um, so you yeah. have a, a history of being too early in things. <laughs> I guess so, which is just as bad as being too late, unfortunately. I, I'm kind of curious how you got started learning, uh, learning how to write smart contracts. This is because this sounds like it was before, you know, all of the documentation, the courses that we have. Now it's like pretty easy to get started. Join a boot camp, right? How did, yeah. how did you get started there? Uh, I think I just uh, kind of really went deep for about a week. I uh, just did smart contract development and kind of just stumbled around into a few walls and figured it out. So I kind of on my, on my own, um, which is kind of usually how I learn personally. So uh, just uh, kind of looked like at a few examples and, you know, started writing small contracts and eventually, um, you know, got even deeper into the rabbit hole. And um, that's kind of how I learned. Yeah. That's always the best way to learn is by practice. Um, yeah, a lot of practice, a lot of fails for sure. <laughs> but, uh, in the end, it gives you, I think it gives you a better understanding than learning from someone else. Um, but it definitely it takes a lot longer and is a, less, a little bit less efficient. Yeah, absolutely. I'm still failing to this day. Um, oh, me too. <laughs> before we uh, talk about Merkle, I really want to uh, cover a lot of the basics because this it's it's a pretty technical topic, right? Uh, I think it's it's an extremely important topic to learn about, to know. But I don't think a lot of people that use crypto today have such a comprehensive understanding of it. Um, let's start with like a, a really basic one. What what exactly is the mempool? How would you describe this? Yeah, um, the mempool, like very simply, is just a list of transactions um, that are waiting to be included in the chain. So if you as a user uh, go on uh, OpenSea, or, sorry, actually, and Coinbase NFT, because <laughs> that's where it worked, but you go on Coinbase NFT and you want to buy an NFT, um, you know, your wallet will pop up like a sign, this transaction model. When you do, uh, basically your wallet just broadcasts it to a bunch of nodes and all these nodes keep a copy of a transaction. And the list of pending transaction is what we call the mempool. There's no like a single area where the mempool is kept. 
it's kind of, you know, each node kind of keeps its own list. Um, it has its own view of um, the mempool. So yeah, very simply a list of transactions waiting to be included in the chain, kind of like yeah. a queue. That's a, that's a great point though, is that um, that nodes can have separate sets of, of transactions in a mempool, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it kind of depends, you know, at nodes that will, are in the US, we'll see transactions coming from US based, uh, you know, users earlier than nodes in Europe and vice versa. So uh, they might have a slightly different set of transactions in the mempool at all times, but it usually gets resolved pretty quickly, especially because, you know, we have things in the background now that will like accelerate transactions through the network and whatnot. But essentially, um, it, it just like to to uh, underline the point that there's no like single mempool service. It's very much distributed across the world. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So um, as a, a, an everyday user, I would want to let's say you know buy an NFT. Um, I submit my transaction on chain, and it sits there in the mempool until it's finally confirmed on chain. Um, yeah. Do I really even need to to care about what the mempool is? Uh. You shouldn't, you really shouldn't. Like it should be very much um, like a background thing. Like when you use Facebook, you don't really care what cables you're using in the ocean to like get to their servers and whatnot. But um, unfortunately, and, and I guess we'll get to it, there's this thing called MEV, which actually impacts transactions in the mempool quite a bit. So um, it becomes a bit of a challenge, you know, for NFTs, there's a specific areas where uh, MEV can have a bad impact, like sniping early collections or arbitraging NFTs. But it's a little bit less uh, uh, prominent than um, token trading, for example. So I would say NFT is not like the best example for why you should care about the mempool. But in general, because we have MEV, um, you should kind of care, not necessarily what is happening under the hood, but know that like your wallet is protecting you against uh, bad actors in the mempool. That's what you care about. Mm -hmm. So it, it, as an everyday user, can I uh, find opportunities by using the mempool, uh, you know, not setting aside MEV bots, whatever. Uh, can I just simply look at uh, transactions pending in a mempool and, and try to find some trends and, and make some trading strategies on that? Um, for the everyday user, I would say no. Um, it was probably possible like two, three years ago, but now it's extremely, it's gotten very much a pro like a professional sport um, to extract MEV from the mempool. So unless you have like some deep technical knowledge about how to build a bot or deep technical knowledge about the whole chain stack, um, there's very, it's very hard to actually make money from uh, MEV in the mempool. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what about uh, private mempools? Are there private mempools? What does this mean? Is that private as in privacy mempools? Or is that, you know, a, a, a mempool that nobody knows about until it's on chain? Yeah, so the, the concept of private mempools is basically um, keeping that list of transactions uh, kind of uh, hidden from every bot out there. So basically, you know, Merkle is a private mempool. So we work with RPC providers, we work with wallets, and we let them um, kind of protect transactions that their users are making. So helping their users get better prices when they swap, um, trade NFTs confidently, and also have privacy on chain until the transaction is actually mined. So that's, that's kind of, um, I would say the broad lines of why you would need a private mempool. In, in using a, a private mempool, um, can I take advantage of, let's say low, low transaction fees or gas fees? Um, or am I simply using a private mempool to protect myself from being front run by an MV, by an MEV bot? No, the, the gas fees will be about the same. Um, I mean, actually, they, they would be exactly the same. Um, it's mostly about protecting yourself from getting front run on your trade or as commonly known as sandwiches. Um, and, you know, sometimes you might get faster inclusion, but it's it's nominal. Um, I would say mostly it's privacy, um, security and MU protection. Yeah. Okay, let's let's talk about MEV now. Uh, I think that's a perfect segue. So MEV uh, is probably one of the most important features in in crypto right now. I, I would say, um, especially if you're you're transacting in in really large quantities. Um, yeah. So let's you know give me a, 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 a an explain like I'm five. Give me a high level. What what is MEV? Uh, let's kind of you know. 
scope down a little bit to uh, DEX trading and NFT trading because there's a lot of different kinds of MEV, but I think the ones that most people are impacted with are, are these two. Um, <clears throat> you know, MEV is just a practice of uh, making money from just observing the chain, really. Uh, it usually takes the form of arbitrage trading. So, uh, for example, a lot of uh, high frequency trading firms are arbitraging between Binance and Uniswap or Coinbase and Uniswap. And that's how you get like good, pretty good prices on decentralized exchanges. Some bots will arbitrage, for example, if you're selling an NFT on OpenSea and there's like a buy order on Blur for a little bit more than or a little bit less than or a little bit more than what you're selling it, they'll arbitrage the difference and pocket the money. But I think maybe an even better way to understand it is that it's not inherent to blockchain. It's just inherent to financial systems as a whole. So there is MEV in the traditional financial system. There's, you know, hedge funds arbitraging, you know, stock prices with like hidden information and whatnot. Um, so it's not necessarily a feature of the blockchain. I would argue that like, for example, sandwiches are a bug of the, you know, the actual protocol like Uniswap or, um, you know, routers in general. But if you you think about MEV, um, it's uh, kind of about finding the inefficiencies in the protocol and the blockchain and extracting that um, through like making transactions on the blockchain. What is a what is a sandwich? So, for example, um, let's say you know you want to. Uh, it usually happens for um, low liquidity tokens. So let's say, um, for example, Pepe Coin is a pretty uh, common one that people were buying a few months ago, uh, where uh, there was, you know, a pretty famous uh, bot called Jared who was sandwiching everybody. So and what that actually means in practice is like when you go buy Pepe Coin, for example, and you want to buy a few thousand dollars of it, um, and you go use like Uniswap.org or One Inch or any of these like kind of Dex aggregator. They'll quote your price uh, when you're swapping. They'll you'll sign a transaction, and that transaction is fixed. And because it is fixed, um, you have to actually put a certain amount of slippage, which means like you know I'll tolerate the price movement of about five percent by the time it lands on chain. Otherwise, um, a lot of transaction would just fail because like the price always changes slightly, and um, uh, like it kind of depends on like where tra when your transaction is mined, but the price will change slightly, especially for uh, highly traded tokens like Pepecoin. So you want to put a, a certain slippage. But what happens is that some bots were like, wait a minute, what if you're going to accept, if we know exactly the worst price that you're going to accept, we're just going to make you accept the worst price and we'll make money from that. So bots will just put a an order, uh, which is the opposite of your order, um, right before your trade. And they'll make the price slightly worse and then they'll profit um, after and then your trade will like recorrect the price a little bit and then they'll um, put an order after you uh, to kind of capitalize on that difference you just created uh, with another exchange somewhere else. So that's kind of what we call it a sandwich because there's a trade before and a trade after and it kind of tries to squeeze as much slippage as possible from your trade. Um, and, you know, and the issue is that the bots know exactly how much slippage you're you're willing to tolerate, so they can just you know maximize it to like perfectly, um, and that comes from the fact that you have no privacy on them on the public mempool. So if you have taken that if you had taken that same transaction, sent it to a private mempool, uh, the bots would have never seen your slippage tolerance, and you would have made it into the block just fine at the the price that you were quoted or slightly or a slight difference. Yeah, I, I love that name, sandwich attack. Uh... And Jared is uh, on Twitter or now X, uh, Jared from Subway.eth, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and there's other reasons why Jared like became so uh, popular, but, uh, you know, just to keep a high level is that they just try and make your price, your price as worse as possible that you'll tolerate um, and kind of extract money from that. Um, are there MEV bots on private pools? Like if I uh, maintain a private mempool, and aren't I incentivized to have my own uh, MEV bot? Yeah, so there is a kind of MEV that we do allow in private mempools that is beneficial to everyone, which is called backruns. So for example, let's say, um, you know, same thing, you want to buy a certain amount of Pippa coin, you want to buy a few thousand dollars. After your trade, there's going to be uh, a price change because your trade will impact the price on decentralized exchanges. Um, and basically, we want to let a bot come in right after you and correct that price difference. 
so that if someone wants to swap, you know, right after you, they will get an even better price on the bot, just like correcting the prices. So we call that back running, which is, um, you know, there's no transactions before you, but we let a bot in after you to correct the prices that your transaction kind of um, modifies. And that's kind of a good kind of MEV because it allows, you know, more efficient swapping for people after you. Um, the bot is actually providing a service, which is correcting prices across DEXs. And so we, you know, we allow those into the private mempool. Interesting. Um, sort of a different subject. Uh, what are RPC providers? Are these, you know, node providers helping the ecosystem? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, for example, you know, the most famous one is probably Infura. I think most developers have heard of that one or Alchemy or like other big ones. Uh, I think Coinbase had even like a nodes product at some, at some point, but it's not uh, working anymore. So this is kind of what I mean by RPC providers is like node providers. Yeah. I see. Uh, and how do these no providers play a role um, in the ecosystem in, in terms of MEV? Are they uh, consuming MEV or are they producing it? Depending on where you stand, it's like a very different meaning, but I'll I'll, I'll get into that little nuance in a bit. Um, you know, RPC providers don't have, they don't sign any transactions. They don't, they're not a wallet. They just receive transactions from wallets or from traders or from bots, whatever. And their job is to um, kind of make sure that that transaction gets broadcasted to the network and gets mined. Um, and uh, by doing that, they're kind of, uh, you know, it's, they, they don't necessarily have a, a reason to use a private mempool. Like they have no obligation from their users to use a private mempool. But for them, you know, because, you know, the upstream wallets or the upstream services don't use a private mempool, they get a bunch of like unprotected transactions. And so we help them protect it from MEV attacks. Um, so for them, it's a pretty good selling point for their users uh, to be like, you know, your transactions that you send through your, through us will be protected, you know, uh, thanks to Merkle. Uh, and we give them back like 90% of the MEV that these transactions generate as well. I see. So, so yeah, let's, let's talk about Merkle. Um... What is this, is this the main problem that you're trying to solve? Is, is... yeah. So uh, the well, the the reason we started this company or I started this company was to build um, this. Uh, it was actually more about redistributing MEV. So currently, um, what was happening uh, over the last year is there's a ton of MEV that was generated. I think it was like in the orders. It, it's hard to like exactly know how many, how much, but in the orders of like a few hundred millions of dollars over the entire year, um, a lot of it went to validators because you know as bots come online, they kind of commoditize the service of extracting MEV. So we come to like 99% plus bribes to validators. So if a bot extracts $100. $99 point some dust is going to go to the validator. So in the end, the validators were the, the ones that are making the most money out of MEV. And, um, you know, we realized, you know, validators already get paid, you know, a certain percentage on their ETH that is staked. So do they really need that MEV revenue or can we redistribute it to whoever is actually generating, generating that MEV, which is, you know, sometimes the protocol, sometimes it's the wallet. And can we actually create um, kind of a healthy, healthy business model for the industry that will, um, you know, generate revenue for not just validators but for other people, and that might, you know, help make better wallets, help, help make better protocols, attract more funding for these um, kind of other ventures. Uh, and so the idea was we would build a mempool that was kind of an alternate mempool or a prime mempool as we call it now, where you'd be able to send the transactions. And we would sell the back run of these transactions and we'd give you the overwhelming majority of the MEV back. So like 90% of it. And then you could take that money and like either give it as cash back to your users or use it to improve your wallet or use it to improve your RPC service and kind of create a healthy business model for all the people that are getting left out of the MEV supply chain currently. So when we talk about uh, providing that value back to users, how much of that value are we talking about? Like are these pennies per transactions? Um, so there's a very small percentage of transactions that actually have MEV. So it's very spiky. I would say, um, I would say 95 to 97% of transactions don't have MEV in them, but the ones that do, they have a bunch. So in the orders of a few hundred dollars. Um, uh, so we are um, sending that money back uh, to whoever sent us the transaction. So for example, if you made the transactions, but you made it through MetaMask, 
and MetaMask chooses to send a transaction to us, we'd give the money back to MetaMask. Um, you know, MetaMask is not a customer, but this is kind of an example. Uh, but if you this chooses, if you as a user put our private RPC in your MetaMask um, and send us a transaction, then we would give money back to you as uh, the user. So it really depends on who sends us the transaction. Yeah, that that's really interesting. Um, so the originator, um, I guess, for the most part, users are uh, originating transactions through a wallet such as, you know, Coinbase wallet such as MetaMask, um, and that service is routing the orders through Merkle, for example, if they were customers, and uh, they would generate the revenue or generate the uh, um, MEV in return. And uh, if you were to use these services and uh, connect directly to the private mempool through Merkle, then you could, uh, in a way, bypass right these, these yeah. wallets. Yeah, you can definitely bypass these wallets. Um, unfortunately, most of these wallets, actually all of these wallets, don't have like built-in MEU protection. I think you know MetaMask is like smart transactions. I'm not exactly sure how these work. I think they might be protected against MEV, but I'm not completely sure. But I would say in general, most wallets are not protected against MEV. Um, and that's what we're seeing like uh, like kind of Merkle Protect or Five Bar Protect or MEV Blocker um, provide an alternative. Even though it's really hard to install and it's like very hacky, um, it works for like a very power users of, of DeFi. But for most um, you know general users, um, they would not have any MEV protection using these wallets currently. Yeah, that's unfortunately. interesting. What, what networks are you guys supporting? So we support Ethereum. Uh, we actually just launched Polygon today. Uh, Congratulations. And we, I think you, and we'll be on, on Binance, I think, uh, over the next two weeks as well. We're just testing it internally currently. Um, what what does it mean to, to, to really support a network? Are, are you running your own nodes? Um, not really. It's um, just providing a mempool for these networks. So th there's a few nuances. You know, Ethereum is the only network where we can, like, for real protect against MEV. Uh, on Polygon and on Binance, they're somewhat developing their own version of PBS and their own versions of like the MEV supply chain. So it's still very early for these networks. So we're supporting them as best as we can and we'll kind of improve as they improve, uh, they being the networks. But currently the only network that we support very well, 100% is Ethereum. And then the, the Polygon and Binance, you know, we, we partially support and we will improve as they improve their own supply chains of MEV. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So what do you think uh, is the next step for Merkle? Is it to uh, continue uh, expanding to more networks? Is it improving the speed or the quality of transactions? Um, what, what's the direction you guys are heading? Yeah, so I think our mission is kind of uh, using MEV for good. So I think over the last year, there was a lot of bad narrative around MEV, around sandwiches and around um, just in, in general, just you know, mean bots extracting money from users, which you know 100% happened and is still like a very big problem. But I think if we kind of turn that around, we could actually use MEV for good. Um, so for example, our first, the first instance of that is using backgrounds to generate money um, and send it back to whoever sent us a transaction to generate healthy business models. But we think there's more to do there. I think this is like a pretty interesting paradigm, which is to um, work with MEV bots instead of against MEV bots in general. So one of the things that we're working on um, is an RFQ system, for example, that could uh, work with MEV bots um, to fill trades as best as possible. So users get the best prices when they swap on DeFi. And I think we're seeing this paradigm kind of happen um, naturally you know with Uniswap x um and other rfq systems uh and just to kind of give a quick like uh, five second explanation like an rfq system is just a router um that uh kind of allows anybody to to to, to fill your trade instead of um the router being actually owned uh by the service so for example one inch um, you know, for a while they were like actually indexing like every single um, DeFi pools and they would give you the best trade. But now they have like one inch fusion where they could also, they let also other people fill the trade if they have a better price. Um, so, and usually the people that fill the trades are MEV bots or MEV extractors. So I think there's a, a pretty interesting paradigm here, which is that we could actually use MEV for good um, and for, to make the blockchain better. And that's kind of what we're working on in general. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you're looking for the best like win-win-win situation, right? 
yeah exactly and i think there is <clears throat> it's it's definitely out there i think it's uh <clears throat> when all these protocols were built there was you know mev was still very theoretical now it's you know extremely present in every single like chain so um now we actually need to figure out a way to work with these mev bots and and i think it's actually is the the right path for DeFi. yeah i want i'm curious to get your thoughts on the sort of overall ecosystem uh where do you think we're we're at right now what what sort of trends are you seeing just very broadly very generally are you seeing users move to more L2s, you know, stay on L1s? Are you seeing more NFTs? Um, um, I think the big trend is less usage, less users, which is um, unfortunate, but uh, I think it's a good uh, kind of reality check for the crypto community as a whole to kind of take a step back and realize, you know, at the end of the day, we're building this thing for people, um, not for bots. We're not like building protocols in the void. Like we need to actually provide value to the end user. And I think more and more people are realizing that. And, you know, we need to close the gap between where wallets are at today and where the mass market is. And closing that gap um, is going to take scaling crypto. Um, so L2s, rollups, optimistic rollups. It's going to take uh, making the experience a lot better. So like making wallets extremely better. It's going to take um, making sure users are not, constantly being attacked on chain by bots. So there's a lot of big issues that we need to solve in order to close the gap to the mass market and actually prove ourselves um, that we can be a very useful and very important uh, part of the financial system going forward. Because I think a lot of people today um, kind of see crypto as a scam and rightfully so, you know, there was a lot of scams for sure, like in, in, in uh, tokens and NFTs. And so we need to really become more professional about how we build products, how we build networks, how we interact with MEV, how we build the chains and how we secure everything. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's the trend is uh, how can we um, kind of close the gap with the, the mass market or, or, or the idea of crypto, which is, you know, giving um, level up the financial access uh, for the entire world. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing where um, the only thing that really matters uh, in in terms of any new technology is having an appropriate number of users, right? Um, how are we best to attract these users? Is it uh, making sure services work for them, or is it making new new fun services like Ponzi schemes and <laughs> these uh, new fun decks? What what are your thoughts? Like, is it is it really about servicing? Is that how we get the next billion users? Yeah, I think the first thing that we need to do is make it much better. Uh, sorry, not better. Um, easier to interact with the chain. So, uh, you know, currently the walls that we have, they're good for developers. They're good for experienced, you know, tech, technical people, but they're not good for general mass market. Uh, there's no way that you could teach like a normal person how to interact with MetaMask or Coinbase wallet currently, unfortunately. So that's one thing we need to figure out. Um, we also need to figure out scaling because he's saying uh, you have financial access, but every transaction that you make costs $15, like it's just not going to cut it. Um, and it's not a very viable narrative. So we need to also make that a lot cheaper. Um, thankfully, like Optimism, Arbitrum, like ZK saying, they're all working on that and, and it's looking pretty promising at this point. And we can't also say, you know, come swap on DeFi and then you get a worse price than if you just use Coinbase. So like, why would you even use DeFi? So we need to make sure that we actually um, take the position of the end user and realize that maybe we're not providing enough value today. And maybe we need to figure out, you know, can we give better prices to people? But even if we give better prices, you know, that just puts us on par with the rest of the world. It doesn't give us an advantage. So can we actually provide services that are extremely valuable to people? And, um, you know, one of the biggest advantages of crypto is the permissionless aspect of it or the borderless ex, uh, aspect of the money that we, we've we created. And so we need to lean into that quite a bit um, with like international remittance or, you know, international payroll, um, these kinds of things that would actually bring value to the table. Yeah, it's it's a funny point on um, on transaction fees, right? Like if you're using Ethereum, I mean, I remember transaction fees being... Um, you know, a couple hundred dollars, right? And that's that's yeah. not a rare case anymore. Um, is this mostly like not optimizing contracts that 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 are interacting on chain? Are, are developers not optimizing for gas? 
Um, I think the best way to think about it is, uh, you know, you wouldn't pay your friends with an ACH transfer. And so you shouldn't really swap on Ethereum either. Like you should swap on a cheaper L2 that would give you a much better gas price and a much faster execution time. I think Ethereum is extremely secure. Um, it's extremely battle tested. And that's kind of its value as a very stable, slow moving settlement layer. But it might not be the best layer for apps. Um, especially, you know, you know, sub E3 or, or, or swapping apps that do use a certain amount of gas. So I think we're going to see, you know, apps move to L2s uh, and, and we're going to see, you know, Ethereum keep uh, being like the, the trusted, very battle tested settlement layer under that. On that point, do you think that uh, the future for L2s would be very app specific? Do you think we're going to have like a single chain for a single app? Is that... Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I, I there's beneficials. There's you know, there's advantages to having a single chain. There's advantages of having multi chains, um, which is maybe a better, better, uh, easier to scale in general. But it's it remains to be seen whether we're going to have millions of chains or a dozens of chains um, just uh, working together. The, the, you know, one of the biggest issues right now is, is, is bridges. Um, it's really slow. It's really unsafe uh, most of the time to bridge assets. So we need to figure that out first. If we're going to have 2 million chains, it's, it's a pretty important problem to figure out first. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if we'll have like a lot of chains or a small amount of chains. It remains to be seen like what kind of technology we can come up with um, and, and how that will scale. Yeah, no, you have a really good point about bridges. Um, that's, that's definitely... Uh, something that needs to be solved in a in a highly secure manner. Um, yeah, and the newer thing is uh, like shared sequencers, which I'm pretty excited about, but it, that's still like a pretty early topic uh, that people are researching. Yeah. Um, what's uh, last question for you? What's one thing that the crypto community isn't talking enough about that you know, frankly, we should be talking about? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we touched on it, but it's um, how do we get our users back? <laughs> Uh, you know, like we're building all this great technology, we're building all these uh, great products, uh, but we need to think about the user. And I think it doesn't come up enough in discussions currently in crypto. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think uh, our our current um, political scheme right now is uh, uh, making a lot of fear and doubt in the industry. It's definitely not making crypto look safer, but I think in time it'll iron itself out. I think it's mostly a short term issue. Uh, but it, it definitely is not helping right now. But, you know, on the flip side, once we have that, all these issues settled, it'll help a lot. Yeah, great. Um, Theo, I, I really want to thank you for your time. I mean, this has been uh, extremely uh, educational. I've learned a lot about mempools, MEV, uh, RPC. Uh, I think what you guys are doing at Merkle is is fantastic. Anything that that helps, uh, you know, all of the players in the ecosystem, I, I think is is bound to succeed. Uh, so I, I really want to thank you again for your time. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for inviting me. You're uh, my first podcast, so I hope uh, <laughs> I hope it went well. Oh, but, yeah, I'm uh, sure. No, this did. was really uh, fun to to reflect on the state of MEV and, and uh, kind of explain my thoughts a little bit as well. Yeah, definitely. And it, it's such a complicated uh, uh, topic that, you know, explaining it in such a way that uh, that anybody can pick it up and, and understand it is is a, a massive benefit for the industry. It is for sure, yeah.